If you look at lists regarding which countries have the best healthcare system, you'll likely see Sweden, Denmark, Canada, Germany, Switzerland, Japan, the Netherlands, and Singapore somewhere on the lists. Ah, the infographics show. Now, there are three reasons why I continue to reply to their videos. One, they have a very large audience for their misinformation, which means there's hundreds of thousands of people who won't know any better after watching their videos. Two, debunking videos is a great way to contrast your ideas with people you disagree with and give your viewers some ideas of how to reply if they hear people making similar arguments. And three, I reply to their videos because it's freaking fun! Oh hi, I'm the heretic. The healthcare issue is near and dear to me because I became politically active around the height of the Obamacare debate, which would have been late 2009 for those of you too young to remember. So when I see people repeating the same fallacies and myths that were so thoroughly debunked, I can't not reply. Let's check it out. Hit it! This is one of the reasons you won't find the USA on these lists. With the American media often telling us being sick in the US can bankrupt a family, today we'll find out how this happens in this episode of the Infographic Show, US Healthcare System Explained. Then you'll happily explain the extensive licensing and education requirements required by law to become a doctor. Conventional wisdom says that you want only the best and the brightest to become doctors, and that makes sense because when your life is on the line, who wants amateurs making those judgments? However, these licenses were lobbied for by the American Medical Association with the expressed purpose of reducing the supply of doctors and making them more expensive. Similarly, if you want to explain the high cost of healthcare in America, then you have to point out the insane regulatory burden and testing requirements the Food and Drug Administration imposes on drug manufacturers. They prevent new, life-saving drugs from entering the market. For example, the antibiotic Septra was delayed for five years at the cost of 80,000 lives, and beta blockers, which reduce blood pressure and treat heart attacks, were delayed at the cost of 250,000, all because the FDA needs more testing. As if that wasn't bad enough, the patent and copyright system all but assures the price of medicine would skyrocket. In 2017, the drug Endari was approved to treat sickle cell anemia, which affects hundreds of thousands of Americans, at a low, low cost of $28,000 a year. The active ingredient? L-glutamine. By active ingredient, I mean that's all it is. Now what is L-glutamine? An amino acid found in most forms of meat, most forms of cheese, especially ricotta cheese, and freaking soybeans. Because of patents, people with sickle cell anemia have to pay thousands of dollars a month to get a drug whose only ingredients can be found in food. Endari has a government-granted monopoly because competing drugs getting FDA approval can take years and cost billions of dollars, even though you can get the ingredients of this medicine from the freaking grocery store. This isn't even going into things like the third-party payer problem with medical insurance, both private and public, such as through Medicare, or how frivolous medical lawsuits encourage doctors to practice defensive medicine, where they test people for diseases or conditions they might not even have, just in case. Obviously, it's not one thing that makes healthcare so expensive in the U.S., and it's tragic. It, it really is. I see horror stories of people who pay $89,000 for life-saving operations. There's no way that doesn't just ruin people's lives and their families. So yes, this absolutely does need to change. The best way to do that, though, is to abolish the FDA, let patients pick what drugs, even untested experimental drugs, they want to take, and that might save their lives. Abolish patents and copyrights and allow drugs to be developed to compete with each other. Eliminate ridiculous licensing requirements to let more doctors into their profession. You know, get the government out of healthcare. Let's see what the infographic show has to say. I'm sure it's wonderful. 
These numbers have been contested, and skeptics tell us there is always more to bankruptcy in these cases than just medical bills. Maybe those bills were just the straw that broke the camel's back. But one thing we can take from the stats, even if not entirely accurate, is that America, a country so developed and rich, might not be doing a good enough job looking after its citizens. America doesn't mean anything. It's a geographic region on a map, drawn out with these imaginary lines called borders. A country doesn't have citizens either. Only a government can make the arbitrary distinction between citizens and non-citizens. Oh, you mean government, don't you? Yeah, I see what you did there. Conflating the country with a coercive monopoly, but making the viewers infer government. It's a clever persuasive trick to get people to finish a thought so they feel like they came to that conclusion themselves and therefore are more receptive to the original idea. I already explained all the ways the government originally tries to help. They've done enough already and need to go away. Shouldn't a developed nation have safety nets in place though? That's a question many Americans ask. How many Danes go bankrupt because they were unfortunate enough to be hit by a bus? I love your appeal to the crowd here, super logical. Anyways. How many Danes do you think suffer through long waiting periods? Enough that export.gov thought to mention that many Danes just skipped the line entirely by paying for healthcare as a private buyer. Now what does that tell you? That waiting periods are so bad that Danes find paying for healthcare twice, once through their taxes and second in medical bills, is preferable to waiting. So what's going on? The Department for Professional Employees tells us this. The American healthcare system is unique, at least for an advanced nation. That's mainly because the USA is the only industrialized nation without universal healthcare coverage. Yeah, so? Just because other countries do it doesn't mean it's the best method of providing healthcare. The majority of societies in the world have a government. That doesn't mean it's the best way to organize society. That doesn't mean it doesn't spend a lot on healthcare. In fact, it spends a lot. A hell of a lot. About 17.9% of the GDP in 2016, or $3.3 .3 trillion. Another thing, if the US did have universal healthcare at the federal level, it would absolutely destroy any semblance of budgetary sanity. Imagine if all $3.3 .3 trillion, or $3.3 .3 trillion, or $3.3 .3 trillion, or $3.3 .3 trillion of what the U.S. spent on healthcare were spent by government. At the time of this recording, U.S. federal tax revenue is $3.3 .3 trillion. What's being proposed is a new item for the federal budget as large as its revenue, and that just assumes healthcare costs stay the same and don't skyrocket as a result of inefficiencies and miscalculations that come with any institution with a government-granted monopoly so insulated from the concerns of customers. Even so, we already have government-provided healthcare schemes. In fact, Medicare and Medicaid make up almost $1 trillion a year and are the largest part of the federal budget, only slightly bigger than Social Security. With $21 trillion in debt, there's no way the U.S. can afford that without massive money printing or skyrocketing taxes. Printing will just result in runaway inflation and the Laffer Curve demonstrate that past a certain point, a government loses tax revenue by raising taxes as people can't afford to stay in business or otherwise be taxpayers. Either way, even if we're being generous and we deduct the cost of Medicare and Medicaid spending, and that the cost of healthcare remains the same, the priesthood of statism still must completely cannibalize the U.S. economy to be able to pay for it. Which means nobody will have jobs. Everything will be outrageously expensive, but hey, free healthcare. Except we all know it's not free. Then you have the Affordable Health Care Act, or ACA, aka Obamacare, which attempted to make it easier for employers to give better health insurance plans for their workers. Uh, I cannot contain my excitement. It also made it possible to give the maximum time limit for short-term insurance plans, and make it possible for employers to give their workers pre-tax cash to buy their own coverage. As we said though, insurance providers don't always give you exactly what you want. They usually have a network of doctors or hospitals and you must use them, and in some cases you are not always covered for the treatment you need. 
Oh, come on. If health insurance is so bad that they only cover Photoshop artists, then why would you speak of a law so glowingly that requires you to pay for health insurance? It's beyond ridiculous and shows you have complete contempt for your audience. Now, don't make me defend health insurance companies, but the government's the reason healthcare is so expensive that paying for health insurance is the preferable alternative. To say nothing of how insurance plans can't be transferred across state lines because of reasons. In the past, some people with pre-existing conditions couldn't afford their insurance, or were even denied it. <laughs> They're actually going to talk about pre-existing conditions. I can't believe it. I'm sorry, but this was brought up and debunked so often. During the Obamacare debate, I'm genuinely concerned for the health of anyone who still unironically believes this is a talking point. And even if it were a legitimate talking point, it's been a problem that's been solved for seven years according to your own narrative. Here's the thing. Buying health insurance with a pre-existing condition is like trying to buy car insurance after you totaled your car. You can try, but any insurance company, even nonprofits that want to break even, are going to generally refuse, as you're a cost to them and they're under no obligation to serve you. Which is just a part of cutthroat capitalism. <sighs> At least we know the agenda behind this drivel now. So what if you have no insurance? As we said, there are government-funded schemes for those in need. Also, because of the Emergency Medical Treatment and Active Labor Act of 1986, hospitals can't just turn you away if you're at the doctor with blood spurting from your neck. Huh. I wonder if unusually high medical bills are even partially a result of hospitals trying to make up for the cost of people unable to pay but still required to be treated by law. So afterwards, they go into some examples of that healthcare in the U.S. is expensive. I mean... We've already established that, so why is it so expensive? You get fixed and leave with only a big bill. This is mainly because of administrative costs. Doctors spend their days doing absurd amounts of paperwork rather than actually treating patients. I wish they'd go into more detail, but there's going to be administrative costs no matter what system or how cheap it is. The only reason administrative costs are so high is because the government requires them to be. The sometimes ridiculous cost of drugs already covered the FDA. The fact that you pay for the possibility of doctors being sued covered that too, but yes. Paying healthcare workers wages I really hope they aren't saying the problem with American healthcare is that healthcare workers get paid. New technologies New technology is supposed to make things cheaper and more efficient. The assembly line is more efficient than guild artisans. The car is more efficient than the horse and buggy which is more efficient than walking. Yet somehow, this phenomenon of technological innovation making things more accessible and affordable is not the case with healthcare. And medical institutions just charging you what they want. Citation needed. Now this video goes on for another two minutes, but there's no need as they just repeat that healthcare is expensive. Which, I mean, nobody contests this. In 2003, there was a big controversy about Canadian pharmaceuticals selling cheaper drugs in the U.S. And a procedure that costs $20,000 in the U.S. can be done for $250 in Costa Rica's private hospitals. The question is, what do we do about runaway costs? The infographic show repeatedly mentioned the U.S. being the only industrialized nation without universal health care, implying that that's the solution. Government-provided health care is not an academic issue. This graph covers the price index of healthcare from the Consumer Price Index in the U.S. They're the same. Until 1965, when Medicare and Medicaid are passed, the price of healthcare shoots up, but it really only begins to skyrocket around 1984, when the Drug Price and Patent Term Restoration Act allowed pharmaceuticals to retain their government-granted monopoly on prescriptions. While also allowing said pharmaceuticals to bribe physicians into prescribing expensive drugs. The government is the problem, posing as the solution. But let's go ahead and look at some examples of universal health care. In Canada, in 2017, the time between referral from a general practitioner to specialist treatment is 21 weeks. In Sweden, it takes 5 to 7 hours 
to see a doctor for emergency care, and that's only during office hours. Finland doesn't even have a universal healthcare system, at least not strictly speaking. It's a municipality system divided into several healthcare districts in which you're only allowed to receive healthcare in your district, even if you got injured somewhere else. Now, what do we say about the UK's National Health Service? Patients wait four hours in the emergency waiting rooms, and things were so bad that the reason it's four hours in the first place is because it's the maximum mandated by law. So to circumvent this, hospitals have patients waiting outside the hospital in ambulances for hours on end before they can even set foot into the waiting room. And the nightmare for patients doesn't end there. They're left on gurneys in hospital corridors for up to 12 hours before being let into a hospital room. 97% of the National Healthcare Service's trusts listed the overcrowding problem as so severe it was unsafe. Now, the real question we should be asking is, how many people have died because of this? Who speaks for the dead who could have been saved but for these ridiculous waiting times? Because I know who speaks for the priesthood of statism, and they're telling us that the problem with bloated, bureaucratic, and increasingly monopolistic healthcare system is that it's not enough of a bloated, bureaucratic monopoly. You don't actually think universal healthcare is about providing healthcare, do you? Of course not. If the priesthood of statism controls who lives or dies, they control you, dear viewer. And control is all they desire. So they'll lie, revise history, and sweep the bodies of the tens of thousands of women who died because of longer waiting times in Canada under the rug. Don't fall for it. Humanity has been sacrificed on the altar of statism enough, and it's time to chart a new course. One where medicine doesn't cost double a yearly wage and you aren't waiting for half a year for a life-saving operation. It's very simple. Get the government out of medicine completely and allow the laws of supply and demand to work without interference from political violence and meddling busybody bureaucrats. Then maybe, just maybe, we can have healthcare so cheap doctors will complain that they aren't making enough money doing it. I mean, why not? That's why the American Medical Association formed in the first place. Questions? Comments? Critique? What do you think about universal healthcare? Any examples I didn't mention of universal healthcare being horrible? Leave a comment below. Support me through Patreon. Like, share, and subscribe to become a heretic today.